Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy had a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers were responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Doormad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven. Shards and Sharts. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four and honestly, I can do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my God. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. 
Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five, fake beards. I can't grow a beard, so maybe I'll just start rocking the, the fake one, you know, like Hatshepsut. Long before Cleopatra, Hatshepsut was the first woman to obtain power as a pharaoh. She was the sixth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. There were just a few that were women in total, but during her reign back in the mid 1400s BC, following the death of Thutmose II, she was determined on being portrayed as a male. The pharaoh, fake beard, the massive muscles, historians believe that this was all done as an act of politics. After her passing, come 1458, BC, her stepson took the throne, Thutmose III, and he destroyed everything in her name and image. Well, mostly everything. Now we have this bearded pharaoh that we're pretty sure we figured out. Number four, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with uh, an interesting method on getting rid of those pimples, that's for sure. Remind you, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, so... Again, creative. Physicians back then discussed pimples as these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin from four to five years. And by squeezing these spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots in there. I don't know. I'd be sick. See ya, now we're single. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. Hey, if a physician ever told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses on my persons, I would faint. That's the scariest news. I've ever heard in my life. That's some bad news, man. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah. Oh, you have acne? Hmm. Are you sure you're not turning into a bird? Maybe it's that. Come back next week. Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds, all to get rid of acne, hopefully. Sorry, maggots, not acne. Maggots. All to get rid of maggots. I'm gonna go throw up. Number three, prosthetics. The ancient Egyptians were a culture of firsts and some of their achievements we still have no idea how they were able to accomplish. Like the pyramids? I couldn't tell you. Could you? Didn't think so. Hit that thumbs up. We're both wrong. We're both learning. It's very likely that some of the first ever prosthetics were used in ancient Egypt. How fascinating. Imagine being the first guy to make a toe, a fake toe. A female mummy who was discovered near Luxor had her death dated somewhere between 950 and 710 BCE. And she was also found with a prosthetic toe made from wood and leather on her person. While this, of course, is a wonderful cosmetic replacement, and it's no secret that the ancient Egyptians certainly valued aesthetics, it seems as though this prosthetic toe was completely functional and was actually used to help this woman walk. The toe, after it was discovered, had significant signs of wear and tear, which then inspired experts to start a study, look a little further. And they did. So they took participants and tested their gait, both with and without the use of a replicated toe. And in ancient Egypt, the common footwear were sandals and walking in them would have been uh, next to impossible without a big toe. So it was clear that this prosthetic was very helpful and important to those similar to this Luxor mummy. Not exactly a beauty practice, but I'm sure they also felt a little more confident with that toe. This is also too impressive to exclude. Beauty list. I'm like, yeah, toes are beautiful. Why not? Throw them on. Number two, henna. I got henna done a few years ago and I totally blanked. I forgot that it lasted longer than like two days. I was like, day four, I'm like, what's going on, man? Is this permanent? While on one hand, pun intended, it is beautiful, ancient Egyptians' use of henna went beyond style and beyond imaging oneself after the gods. See, henna also has cooling effects on the body and ancient Egypt was, uh, was quite hot. It was used by ancient Egyptians to color their hair and fingernails and shades of red and orange. Now this shade, this exact shade, also provided comfort on hot days. Come back with some henna. Kind of nice. It lasts longer than a few days though, just so you know, if you want to get henna. It's important to know. That guy did not tell me in Greece. No, he did not. And finally, number one, deodorant. When it comes to deodorant, today we listen to the old spice guy. He's always whistling about something new. But long before he was born, ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs for deodorant. They made perfumes and oils, this is commonly known, but they were also the first to use any type of a deodorant. Deodorant, like underarm deodorant. It was so impressive. Ostrich eggs mixed with a little fat and tamarisk and tortoise shell and then nuts. Mix them all together and bam, there you go. You're ready for date night. Just apply all of that on your body. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. See, Egyptians would also use porridge balls. How creative is that? Flavored porridge rolled up and safely tucked in in your underarm right there. Right there on your little smelly chicken wing. This morning I had some deodorant just crumble apart when I was applying it. You ever have that happen? Turns to fetish cheese all of a sudden, mid-application. Now my bathroom sink looks like a Greek salad. Smells great, but not practical. Might have to go back to the porridge ball method. Who knows? Maybe I have one right now. Maybe that's why I haven't moved this arm the whole time. Who knows? What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, hot topics. 
Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visine, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling, but as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just 
great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They had to soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, cancer treatment. All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith Papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, Ugh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a, a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer. To, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one, 
Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith Papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. That's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, dirty beds. Okay, so far on this disgusting series, I can't believe we're on part seven, but we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed. Pretty yuck, that's if you were lucky enough to have a bed, of course. If you were rich in the 1400s, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. That was like the place to be. Social gatherings in your bedroom, that's my worst nightmare. A couple of nights talking about noble deeds, meanwhile you're all tucked in with your ass out, hair all messy, half asleep, like, huh, who is it? Most of the time in the 14th century, your mattress wasn't even a mattress, it was just a pile of straw. It was horrible, you had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day, remind you, because you'll freeze at night otherwise, right? Because you're basically outside, these barns, this old wooden, not great. Also, these beds weren't in your rooms or anything, they were just like tucked in a corner. You didn't have social gatherings around the sack of straw, you know what I mean? Your bed was more often than not riddled with bird poop as well. You weren't alone in these cold rooms, you know, birds hiding up above. Also, spiders? I don't even want to know. I don't even want to dive into that. Let's move on. Number nine, mouthwash. Ancient Romans would use urine as mouthwash. I believe we've mentioned that before on this, again, disgusting series. That's always a fun fact to bring up at a house party next time you're drinking some Mountain Dew. Just be like, oh, did you know? The ammonia in urine was thought to ideally wash away the yuck. You just gotta get past the whole urine part, I guess. Doctors hate this one trick. Mm. Nero would tax the trade of imported bottled urine. That's how popular it was at this point. Some poor soul with a clipboard would have to stand all day and just be like, yep. In the 12th century, St. Hildegard von Bingen would advise all to wash their mouth with cold water to remove bacteria. Yeah, if only it was that easy, okay? Just one quick sh and spit it out and then you're good, no. I wish it was that easy, pal. Tortoise blood was also used once as mouthwash alongside goat milk and vinegar. Out of those three options, imagine not picking goat's milk. You're like, hmm, but what year is the tortoise blood? Number eight, bath beans. Not to be confused with bath bombs, bath beans we're talking about. Bath beans, beans in the bath. Bath beans were used thousands of years ago in ancient China. They were these bars, or beans rather, these chunks, still like beans. They're made of bean powder, herbs, and much like our bath bombs today, they also included some nice fragrances. Just have a little bit of a, mm. The pancreas of a pig was also commonly used, so it wasn't totally nice. Once the blood was drained, you'd mix it with the bean powder and the nice stuff. Now originally, it began by using leftover water from cooking rice. Eventually, it became bath beans, which is, you know, AKA soap old soap. Some bath beans were loaded with ingredients, much like the bath bombs we can find today, so they were all quite unique. You could make your own little bath bean. Number seven, purple nut sedge weed. Archaeology is fascinating. And no, I'm not just talking about dinosaur stuff. They look at rocks and be like, ah yes, a Viking was here thousands of years ago and he was a Libra. How do you know that? This is so impressive. Ancient sites tell a story. And Karen Hardy, an archeologist with the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies at the University of Barcelona, she found another ancient hygiene practice while studying a prehistoric site in Sedan. Plaque, it turns out, can last thousands of years. It calcifies once it mixes with food, then after it's stored below the gums, game over, it's there for good. Specifically, thousands of years ago, it's, it was there to stay. We couldn't really get that out. Hardy was studying remains that were two to 9,000 years old, and in their teeth, they found traces of pollen, dirt, and plant fibers. More specifically, they found evidence of a plant called purple nutsedge. It contained lysine, which is an amino acid that we need to live, so although it didn't taste the best, it sure was vital. Ancient Egyptians used the root for perfume, but this new study shows that purple nutsedge may have been used to prevent tooth decay. They would just chew on roots all day to take care of their teeth. The plant produces antibacterial chemicals, so chewing on them would have been beneficial. Little different than the inside of a tortoise, I'd say. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Number six, smoking. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. Sore throat, and eh, smoke this pack of cigarettes. I'm sure that'll help. Help you cough a bit more, if anything. 
We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas in like part one or two or three or something over there. But this is just bad advice. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing in the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would also have to blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, how insane is that? Can you imagine that actually playing out in real time? He's not breathing, quick. Hang on. Cut to 1964, turns out smoking is bad for us. Who knew? Cigarettes were labeled as deadly going forward after that point. It's pretty intense now though, eh? The photos on cigarette packages now, they're haunting to look at. I still think teenagers smoking to stay in shape is a bit scarier to be honest than that image. She's always like, her face is just like pulled, so scary. Don't smoke. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again, who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for? Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? And nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that it would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. 
It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found, went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault, with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today we have people with machines who do it. Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off our list at number 10, ancient Egyptian eyeliner. Whenever you see hieroglyphics or any art depicting the great pharaohs, they're usually rocking some impressive eyeliner. They look great, right? Like a 90s pop star, they look awesome. Ancient Egyptians were the OG eyeliner users. They made their own eyeliner from lead salts. And no, before you think about getting creative, do not try this at home. This wasn't an ideal process. See, for starters, these salts were quite high in lead concentration. So in order to avoid that mess, ancient Egyptians first first had to process and then filter that lead salt for up to 30 days in order to get the lead levels low enough to even be applied. So you had to plan accordingly. You're like, oh, I have a pharaoh date in 30 days? Perfect, we'll start now. It was a hazard if done incorrectly. Not only was this ancient beauty practice, well, beautiful to look at, but Egyptians also needed eyeliner to protect against sun damage as well as fight off any infections. Yeah, we don't encourage rubbing lead on your eyes today. We have a few different methods on, you know, how to look good. I think. None of them include lead, hopefully, ideally. Number nine, hair gel. Back in my day, in high school, I had to use Dippity Do Extra Hold Hair Gel. Yeah, I showed a scale on the side, I always got the five out of six hold, that was good. Six was too much, nobody ever did the full six, that's crazy talk. But in ancient Egypt, we didn't have styling spiking glue and blasting free spray by DJ Polly D. No, we have that today, unfortunately, but back then, a little different. Back then, ancient Egyptians loved styling their hair, but again, before DJ Polly D was born, what is a pharaoh to do? If the Great Pyramids are any indication, they knew something that we didn't. Ancient Egyptians knew how to keep their hair in one place all day long. And that heat too, how do you do it? My curls, I'm jealous. Their hair styling gel was made with shea butter and coconut oil. But more often than not, they would replace coconut oil with almond oil. So this was a completely natural and strengthening styling gel. Cut to today, we have whatever that is. Psst, ice spray, that's awesome. DJ Polly. psst. No. Number eight, coffee scrub. I love coffee. I don't think I love coffee enough to do a coffee face scrub, but hey, never say never. I'll try anything once. Ancient Egyptians would use coffee scrub to reduce inflammation, improve blood circulation, and since it's a ground up material, it's gonna remove those dead skin cells at the same time. Next holiday season, grab your aunt some coffee scrub. Just tell her how it reduces puffiness, improves the skin's texture, all that good stuff. It'll give you that youthful feral look that you've been going for, you know what I mean? Merry Christmas, here you go, coffee on your face. Using grounded coffee powder to exfoliate your skin sounds like a new idea. It's certainly a hot trend today. 
say. But before TikTok, ancient Egyptians already knew these benefits. Damn, I'm gonna get a coffee scrub. Maybe I'll do it, I don't know. After I'm done this cup, I'll just rub it on my face, on my desk, and see what uh, everyone says. Number seven, dead sea salt. You'll never feel more alive than when you use dead sea salt. Here we go. Ancient Egyptians were ahead of the exfoliation game. Dare I say, they invented it. Not only were coffee scrubs a necessity, but salt from the Dead Sea was one of the most popular ancient Egyptian skincare products ever. We traveled far and wide for this one. Salt collected from the Dead Sea was used to exfoliate dead skin cells, and it was so well known at this point that rumor has it, Cleopatra herself would travel all the way to the Dead Sea from Egypt just to take a bath. Yeah, let's be honest, after this point, we'd all love a rejuvenating Dead Sea float. That sounds way better than what I've got at home. Well, bathtub, I can't even fit in this thing. Dead Sea sounds way better. I once left a house party early to go have a bath. Swear to God, York University. Dipped at like 10 o'clock. I was like, I'm cold, I'm not doing this. 40 minute walk, worth it. Leave your friends for a bath, do it. Number six, wax cones. Head cones, also known as perfume cones, were used in ancient Egypt. You've probably seen them in a thumbnail here at some point. The art depicting head cones is quite unique looking. It's like a pharaoh with a triangle on their head. You're like, what's happening there? What is this? Was this like Illuminati? What is this? Long before Pantene Pro-V, when it came to head cleanliness, these triangular wax cones were here to save the day. And they looked pretty fun to use. I don't know. They would just sit on top of your head. You didn't need to mix anything with lead for 30 days or bran or anything like that. You didn't need to put any organs in jars, just a wax cone atop of your head. Easy. Back in 2019, experts found archaeological evidence that they were in fact used. So yeah, not just a glyph real life history. So I have to bring this up. Men and women alike would wear this cone and your body heat would slowly melt the wax cone down and through your hair. The cone itself was made of oils, fat, resin. It would be placed on their wig or directly onto your head and it would keep melting and refreshing all day long. It's like a little candle almost. A nice little human candle. Nice little Egyptian man candle. As fascinating as ancient Egyptian culture is, I don't think anybody misses wax cones. It's a little easier nowadays. I'm too tall too. I can't have a wax cone. Are you kidding me? It would hit this mic. No way. Number five, superstition. Uh, yes, here we go, this one's good. In the medieval era, cats were often associated with witchcraft, because of course, look at them, right? So evil. The church, which held great power during the medieval period, condemned cats as a symbol of paganism and the devil, of course leading to widespread persecution. However, the rapid decline of cats led to a significant increase in that rodent population. Yeah, remember those fun balls of fur that I just mentioned? That's where this all started, because of evil devil cats. It was our fault the whole time. Who would have thought? The condemning of cats led to a surge in a number of rats and mice that carried diseases. King Edgar the Peaceful, so peaceful, we know him. He reigned from 959 to 975. He issued a law in the 10th century that set a value on cats and imposed fines on anyone who harmed or killed them. Now we're talking, now we're getting back into the nice peaceful, the peaceful, I mean, come on. The law was intended to encourage the breeding and keeping of cats as they were now seen as valuable for controlling the rodent population that threatened crops, food supplies, and um, us. We matter as well, I guess, humans. Number four, law and order. Misuse of weights and measures. Yes, false advertising back in the old olden days. Let's talk about this. How did you sell stuff without, you know, getting caught? Medieval merchants were required to use standard weights and measures when selling goods, right? That's protocol. And those who tried to cheat by using inaccurate measures or weights could face some brutal penalties. I just saw a video of some expert fisher and he's putting weights in a fish's mouth. He's trying to cheat his way through a fishing tournament. He got caught. It was on Reddit. It was so funny. But like back in the medieval times, he would have been screwed. Fraudulent begging as well. We've seen this on Reddit at some point. Begging was a common practice in medieval times, but those who were caught faking a disability or pretending to be in dire times, well, then they could be punished with public humiliation or even physical mutilation. They rhyme, but they're very different things, those two. Eavesdropping as well, one of my favorite things to do of all time. Love listening in on things, right? Listening in on somebody else's conversation is great, but back in the dark ages, this was considered a serious crime. And those who were caught listening, hmm, what's that? They could be fined or imprisoned, and in some cases, eavesdropping was seen as a form of treason, since it could be used to gather information that could be used against the state. So sometimes, yeah, real bad. You don't want to hear the wrong thing, or else they would, you know, gallows. You hear? Mm-mm, gallows. Number three, health plan? Yeah, question mark, because, yeah, here we go. During medieval England, the average life expectancy was around 30 to 35 years, with many people biting the bullet to poor nutrition, lack of sanitation, infectious diseases, and rats everywhere. Ugh. Living conditions sucked, limited medical knowledge was all you had, and 
Frequent wars and famines were always rolling around. So yeah, all that in 30 years or less. How fun. Common illnesses included respiratory infection, dysentery, and tuberculosis. Medical treatments weren't great at the time, of course. There was a, a lot of prayers, that's for sure. That's a lot of people relied on those. Dark Age medical treatments included herbal remedies, bloodletting, and surgical procedures performed all without anesthesia. So you're gonna feel every wrong move to say that. However, there was also some advancements in medicine during this time. It wasn't all bad, including the founding of hospitals and the use of quarantine to prevent further spread of disease. How fun is that? Imagine being the first person to think of a quarantine. You're like, hey you, no, go over there. How does that sound? Yeah, we're doing something right now, trust me. Number two, war. What is it good for, you know? In the Middle Ages, this was a time of frequent warfare in Europe. This was due to various factors, such as the rise of feudalism, religious conflicts, and territorial disputes, all those good things. One of the most significant was the Hundred Years' War, which began in 1337 and lasted, well, as you could guess, until 1453. Yeah, it wasn't quite, it was a hundred and a bit, but you know, sounds cool if we say it like that. It was fought between England and France over control of territory in France. The war saw significant battles, such as the Battle of Agincourt and the Siege of Orleans, and it had a a profound impact on both countries. Another notable medieval war, you've probably heard of this one, the Crusades. Yeah, that one for sure. The Crusades were a series of religious wars fought between the Christian nations of Europe and Muslim nations of the Middle East. Now the Crusades began in 1096 and lasted until the late 13th century with varying degrees of success and failure from both sides to say the least. A lot of deaths, a lot of, a lot of warfare, a lot of horribleness, horrible ways to go. And finally, number one, plagues. The well known of these plagues back then was the Black Black Death, which, I mean, scary name, but yeah, it's pretty much nailed it. The Black Death first appeared in the mid 14th century and killed an estimated 25 million people in Europe, or at that point, one third of the population. Yersinia pestis bacterium was spread by fleas that infested rats. Again, so awful. Other medieval plagues include the Justinian Plague, which struck the Byzantine Empire in the sixth century and killed an estimated 25 million people, and the Plague of Athens, which hit, well, Athens during the Peloponnesian War in the fifth century BC. Another deadly outbreak during the medieval period was the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720, killed 100,000 people in France. While it's one thing to live life through a plague like we have done, we can be glad that it's not like these ones because they lasted much longer. And like I mentioned earlier, um, I don't f with rats, so. Yeah, this one seems a little more calm near the toes. That's always great, love that. Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian worlds, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found for the fourth dynasty. This mummy in his first molar was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done or most most of this was done without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep and then you wake up and you're like, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive, but still extremely important, was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on. Knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair or tendons or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's, Kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. 
And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man, you're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book, well, rather in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, like Kyle has, kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma arisenol. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, loincloths. Going back to ancient Roman and also ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Either that or you would just be naked. I found this neat step-by-step -step online on how to make your own loincloth, because that's apparently what I do on my free time. Thank you for asking. And it's a bit more complicated than I thought. It's way more, it's way more complicated than just throwing on sweatpants or even, you know, the towel fold like a toga. This had numerous steps. We don't have a lot of archaeological evidence because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather to make underwear. That's a fun little fact right there. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the hot sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but I'll let Adam tell you about that one another time. That's more of a, that's more of a at home one. Number four, food as medicine. Trying to prevent bad things before they happen, it is a very human skill to have. And when it comes to preventative medicine, the Egyptians had some methods. One more obvious solution is diet. Eating the right stuff truly does help lead to a longer life, but eating the specific right stuff can directly prevent certain issues. As a prime example, the laborers that would build the massive iconic structures we know Egypt for today were kept fed with diets that include a lot of onion, garlic, and radishes. Now, I don't know if the ancient Egyptians knew the chemicals these foods contained, or if they just put two and two together, but onions, garlic, and radishes contain, why did I do this to myself, contain allostatin, allicin, and raffinin which are very helpful when it comes to preventing diseases in the super crowded working and living conditions the laborers existed in. That allicin really helps. Another example would be to cure night blindness. In these circumstances, doctors fed their patients powdered liver, which is rich in vitamin A, which is a vital nutrient for vision. Again, I don't know if they knew it contained that specific fang or if they were just like, hmm, I eat liver and I can see better. Discovery! Number three, acne. Ancient Egyptians came up with an interesting method to getting rid of those pimples. Now, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing, and physicians back then discussed pimples as such. Ready for this? They called them these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing set spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were referred to as maggots. That's what they thought they were back then. Imagine your partner, hey, can you get this pimple on my back? Yeah, I think I got some maggots, thanks. 
No, no thank you. That's pretty horrible. That's a horrible reference. They would refer to severe cases of acne as maggots that lie in a bed of roses. I would faint. I would be so sick. If a physician told me I had maggots that lie in a bed of roses anywhere on my body, I would throw up. I'd pass out. I'd be so upset. Dermatological disorders were thought to be human skin taking on the properties of animals. Yeah, you have common acne. Hmm, maybe you're turning into a pigeon. Who knows? Ancient Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds all to get rid of acne. Yeah, sounds like a horrible alternative. I would much rather just have acne. Maggots? Dude, I'm done with this channel. I'm out of here. That's so gross. Number two, eye makeup. Almost everybody and their mums knows that the Egyptians wore that crazy awesome eye makeup. But what you might not know is that it didn't just serve the purpose of making you look absolutely stunning. No, a lot of these eye makeups were lead based. Now, that sounds pretty bad. I can't lie. It does. And it likely was for some, but it was possible that it boosted nitric oxide by up to 240% in cultured human skin cells. I don't know what cultured human skin cells means, but that's the quote. If you know, let me know down below. What the heck does nitric oxide do? Well, that I do know. It helps to boost up your immune system to fight diseases, which, guess what? That's pretty important, especially in the marshy areas around the Nile, where eye infections are actually pretty darn common. What's cool is that research suggests the Egyptians actually knew that and specifically synthesized the makeup for this purpose. Huh, neat. Finally, number one, mummification. Back in the day, mummification was common, and even today we're finding more mummies. Like, literally last month we just unraveled six more. It's crazy. We're uncovering more ancient history, which is great, but how exactly was this process done? We're talking about back maggots and stuff. What, what did they think about this? How did this even begin a, to be a thing? Well, it wasn't cheap. For starters, being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's a pretty brutal process as well. What you would do is you would put a hook, or well, they would put a hook in your nose after you'd passed away, and then they would pull out your brain and all that just squishy stuff, just out all through this thing right here. And then they would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all those goods, all the organs, boom, see ya, gone. And while those are drying, you would put your lungs and liver in jars. And then you would put the heart back in the body and then you would wash the insides out with wine and spices all that stuff turpentine turpentines all the time and teens just all in there washing it out then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days that's a long time but around day 40 you would stuff it with sand now come day 70 finally that's when you wrap them in the mummy bandages then the sarcophagus awaits forever really and then there's just jars of organs also stored in your burial chamber now it's we don't do it it's not as fun anymore we don't put our organs in jars we don't stuff anyone with sand we should, you know what? We should bring I back mummies. Let's just do should. it. I think it's time. Yeah. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. 
Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Ooh, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells. And when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and, you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells. Can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw! Okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm going to stick to the spearmint. S spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, face care. So we've gathered that folks in the Middle Ages didn't bathe often, but when they did, it was just the necessities, right? They didn't have time to you know, Old Spice, all their stuff up like they do. Then time to dance in the shower and shower backwards. It wasn't a fun event. Hands and face, that's it. That's all you really need anyways. If you couldn't afford a walk-in shower, back in the day, you'd have to invest in an ewer and basin. You would all have to share the same thing and take turns dipping your hands and face in all day long, just the same. Hmm. Protecting your face was vital for ancient Egyptians 6,000 years ago. They would honor the gods with makeup, but at the same time, it would also protect their skin from the sun. We love that. Today we have like SPF creams. I'm like, this is nothing, this is no fun. Ancient Greeks would use oils to clean their face and they would later scrape it off. And in the 1700s, many believed in saunas and sweat cleansing. The number one trick to clear skin, you guessed it, milk baths. Milk is really the name of the game for this part seven, eh, wow. Goat milk mouthwash, milk baths. I'm gonna go milk a cow after this video. Just because, you know, feels right. Number four, python bile. Yeah, I just said python bile. So if you're eating food right now, I'll just I'll, I'll give you a sec, hit that pause button. Not only pythons also, but numerous animals, their bile would be used to treat ailments. Ulcers of the female genital area. Yeah, that's what the doc was giving you. Python bile, have fun. Ancient Chinese physicians would also hand over some elephant bile as well if bad breath was bringing down your game. Elephant bile mixed with water would get rid of halitosis. Honestly, any type of bile, just count me out. I just won't brush, how's that? Taylor, why do you have bad breath? Oh, have you seen the alternative? That's why, Mike, that's why. I almost tripped, but that's why. I almost broke my leg. I'm upset about bile. Number three, malaria. Perhaps one of the most bizarre ways to treat one disease 
definitely is by getting another. If you suffered from syphilis back in the early 1900s, there wasn't really much help you could get. That was until Austrian physician Julius Wagner Joreg came along. He received the Nobel Bell Prize for this discovery, and as bad as it sounds, it's honestly quite the breakthrough. Julius discovered that malaria-induced fevers were the key to treating syphilis. Ye nice. Now we're, I guess, we don't do this anymore because, well, malaria is still horrible, and a hefty amount of patients lost their lives trying this method. So no, we at Bumblebee do not recommend this method. We have other ways to treat it now. Number two, rabies. It's a part seven. Let's talk about rabies. Might as well. This is a haunting list so far. Pre-rabies vaccine, I mean, what the hell did we do? Before 1885, that's when French scientists Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux, they developed the first rabies vaccine. We were pretty much SOL if a rabid animal were to bite you beforehand. I mean, one of the leading theories to prevent the spread of rabies was to not let your dog outside while there was a full moon. You know, that middle-aged bull where every remedy just sounds like a side quest in Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Oh, you'll need one egg and two pigeons. I'm like, what? I have, a, I have strep. What are you talking about? In 16th century Europe, it was a literal joke if you had rabies. Doctors quite literally told you to ingest 40 grains of ground liverwurst and wash it down with 20 grains of pepper and a half pint of milk. That's it. That's how you cure rabies. That's how you do it, I guess. You got to ingest that each morning for four days in a row. Oh, and you also need to have a cold bath every day for a month. Imagine if this really was the only solution, even today. Just cuts to us in 2022 with iPads, technological advancements, we're creating new vaccines. But in order to cure rabies, you still need to slam some milk and have a bath. It's like, yep, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way we've done it so far. Hygiene history is insane. I'm going to push for a part eight. Hit that thumbs up so I can keep talking about this nonsense. This is insane. I learn something horrible every day here. And finally, number one, electricity. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around a lot longer than most of us think. It just didn't work back then, you know? Also, we don't call it shock therapy anymore. We're well past that. Tiny electric currents would be sent through your brain, ideally changing its chemistry, and over 1,000 people a year undergo this treatment. But back in ancient Roman times, this procedure, of course, was a little sketchy, just a little wee bit. They would use electric eels. Yeah, they would hang out with a bunch of electric eels to hopefully relieve a headache. Again, I'd rather just have a headache. I'm not trying to become a Spider-Man villain, okay? I just, I'm nearsighted. Today we believe the seizure aspect is beneficial, but back then it was believed that electricity was the key here. We would drink electrified water and wonder why nothing's happening. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's no calzone, red flag yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful. For some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. It seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients, applicable powder and bugs. Yeah, you know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you can find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps, as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. 
How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Play said glazed servant away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You just stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day, you just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Gonna put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four in one shampoos. That wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, Aqua Tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the 
toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag. And when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day. Which is fine, I think? I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesbro Pons bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Kicking off the list at number 10, Karem Lou. It's the 1930s, you're looking for a way to get rid of those upper lip hairs. Well, Karem Lou promises to have your back. They actually promise to have your armpits as well. Yeah, armpit hair and upper lip hair. Gone. For good, you say? Wow, that sounds absolutely lovely. Just don't read the fine print. Don't flip it and zoom in. Don't zoom in. This cream was applied to the upper lip, but side effects caused hair loss all over your body. And sometimes users would suffer from paralysis. It was on the market for $10, which back in the 1930s, that's a lot, a lot, a lot. Like for hair removal cream, that's a lot, a lot. Those are like Beats headphones? What is this? The Journal of the American Medical Association called this product out as viciously dangerous. Rightfully so, and those who suffered from those harsh side effects collectively sued the company into bankruptcy come 1932. The silent killer here in the cream was thallium, commonly used as rat poison. That ought to do it. Number nine, ancient birth control. Although birth control today is easier than in ancient times, it's still a chore. It's routine, it's something you have to keep track of daily, and things go wrong if you don't and lose track. There's a plethora of side effects. You have to take fake ones just so your body, what? Your hormones are all over the place. You can get cancer from these, you can get blood clots potentially. There's really, there's very little research on long-term effects for birth control pills. And also, I'm speaking not from experience. There's no birth control pill for guys. This is wildly unfair. I have the most respect. These pills mess you up. My friends will tell me their side effects and I can't believe it. You're all troopers. Ancient Egyptians, their method of ancient birth control was by mixing acacia fruit with honey and ground dates. This paste would then be used directly and believe it or not, it was rather effective. Acacia gum ferments and then turns into lactic acid, which can prevent pregnancy. Not all of these ancient methods worked like this. There's another that's really bizarre and I'll save that for the end. It's absolutely insane, I can't believe it. We'll ease our way there, you know, we'll, we'll start nice. Number eight, Lash Lure. Turning the calendars back to 1933, the year FM radios and drive-in movie theaters were introduced and as well as the horrifying and deadly mascara, Lash Lure. This 1930s cosmetic contained a chemical, P-phenylidamine. That's how you know it's bad, when you can't even pronounce the thing. This mascara left blisters all over your face, your eyelids, the whole thing, it was really bad. There was eventually a death in 1933. One woman sadly developed an infection, a bacterial infection, and then passed away. It was so bad that later that year, her before and after photos were used in an FDA display titled The Chamber of Horrors. It was a horrible incident, but a good way to get the attention from higher ups, so something like this never happens again. Lash Lure was then the first product in history that was removed from stores entirely, so it worked. We're in the middle of something kind of similar now, I think. Cigarette packages have those horrible side effects to smoking right there on the packaging. The girl with the face. Could we see the day smoking is outlawed? 
I don't know, I feel like we're close. It's caused quite a few more deaths than Lash Lure, that's all I'm saying. Number seven, bad toothpaste. Doramad toothpaste was advertised in the 1920s. The ad shows a blonde lady with a lovely smile. Some would even say glowing. Right below reads Doramad radioactive toothpaste. Radioactive toothpaste, I've uh, hmm, that sounds bad. I've played enough Fallout to know that radioactive toothpaste probably isn't a great product, especially to put in and around your mouth. It even loudly advertises its radioactive ingredients. Can you imagine this? Increase the defense of teeth and gums. The cells are loaded with new life energy. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. That last one I made up, but you can't tell, right? How insane is this? This secret ingredient to shinier smiles and brighter futures was thorium. The god of thunder does not brush with thorium. He uses it to polish his hammer. Yeah, it's very toxic. Number six, Gorad's cream. Once advertised as a magic beautifier, doesn't that sound like a neat time? Gorad's Oriental Cream hit the market back in 1936. This cream was supposed to freshen up your skin, make you look lighter, younger, whatever Paul Rudd's doing, whatever his secret is, we're still trying to figure that one out. That sort of thing. But instead, this skin cream had one user ending up in a book that's very Chamber of Horrors style. This magic ingredient that was meant to magically make you beautiful had some magic mercury in it. Not something you want on your face, yeah, at all. The results were haunting. This woman had soon developed black gums, her teeth loosened, and dark rings appeared around her eyes and even her neck. Mercury poisoning is not fun. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head. A brilliant play. Might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? when all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruined the vibes. And now, you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel, and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile would get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey would get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un-just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work. Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. To some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, red dead bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically the Southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the South just didn't have the same resources the North did. So after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the South washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band-aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo-boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, 
Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins, and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, and they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm going to go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it. That's actually it. Yeah, we like that. That's it. Number 9, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible, and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious, as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom, or be late for your event, or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire, as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on, 
I know I could do some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. It's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war? I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty-induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. 
Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec Classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Starting our list off at number 10, natural disasters. We'll begin with the Great Flood of 1607, cause eh, why not? This flood was a catastrophic event that affected the southwestern coast of England. Now the flood occurred during the night of January 30th, 1607. Happy New Year, I guess. Let's all run for our lives. And it was caused by a combination of heavy rain and high tides. This in turn caused floodwaters to rise up several meters and destroying villages, crops, livestock, and sadly claimed the lives of roughly 2,000 people. Sounds pretty tragic, but believe me, this is number 10. Yeah, it only gets worse right after this. Turn the clock back a few hundred years to the Great Storm of 1362. As its name suggests, this too was a massive storm that hit Northern Europe, of course causing widespread flooding and destruction. It was one of the most destructive natural disasters in recorded history, with an estimated 25,000 people losing their lives. Sounds bad for number 10, but honestly, the lives lost it just gets bigger and bigger as the list goes, believe it or not. Number nine, medical care or lack thereof. In medieval England, medical care was limited and often um, ineffective. Yeah, nothing really worked that well because they didn't know what was happening, right? Instead of cavities, they thought you had worms crawling around in your teeth. Good old toothworms. Knock that out with a rusty hammer. Knowledge was limited, physicians were expensive and mostly treated wealthy patients at the time, while the peasants over here, us peasants eating bread, rotten dry bread breaking our teeth, well, we got the barber surgeons who performed basic surgeries and bloodletting. That's about it, it's all they did. You walked in, you're walking out lightheaded. You're gonna faint immediately. They were a barber slash dentist slash surgeon? What? You already know you're screwed when you see that resume. Herbal remedies and charms were commonly used because, well, that's all they had, and the church played a significant role in healing practices. Aside from that, not much left. You're, yeah, you're SOL, my friend. Hospitals were established to care for the sick, but conditions were often unsanitary and going there led to the spread of disease rather than curing anything. Medical knowledge, again, was so limited and many diseases and injuries were untreatable, leading to a high mortality rate that we're gonna talk about a bit later. Ooh, it gets worse, it gets worse. Number eight, punishments. The pillory was a device that consisted of a wooden framework with holes for the head and the hands. Offenders were were placed in the pillory while they were publicly exposed and sometimes pelted with rotten food and or hard objects. Sounds pretty nasty. The whipping post is exactly what you would imagine. A wooden post to which offenders were bound to and then of course they were whipped with a whip or a rod. This punishment was often used for minor offenses, believe it or not. Uh, yeah, it gets worse. The ducking stool was a chair attached to a long pole that was used to dunk offenders in water, often in a pond or a river, dirty river, you get an ear infection in that one for sure. It was used to punish scolds and nagging wives. Yeah, bring on your nagging wives. We'll just take them for a dip, I guess. Your arms are gonna be jacked by the end of it. The brank, this was a metal mask that was placed over the head of the offender with a sharp piece of metal, and then that metal would go in your mouth and prevent you from talking. It's like a saw trap. As I was describing it, I was freaking myself out just then. This punishment was often used for gossipers. Yeah, again, these were all minor offenses, all things considered. Today, you get a slap on the wrist. Back then, you get rotten food hucked at you. What? 
Number seven, poor sanitation. Yeah, you're gonna wash your hands many a times in medieval England. Oh boy, sing happy birthday thrice. How does that sound? Sanitation during medieval England was very poor and resulted in widespread diseases and epidemics. Thought today was yucky? Eh, way worse. There was a lack of understanding of hygiene and the connection between poor sanitation and illness. Waste and sewage were commonly disposed of in the streets, just hey, why not, what up? Or it was dumped in the Thames, leading to a high concentration of filth and contaminants Contamination, which I'll talk, I'll talk about that more later. That's a really bad day happens with that river. Public bathhouses were both used for bathing and toilets. So pick which side you're gonna use accordingly. Better, better be confident which side you're going into. This of course led to the increase of diseases being spread. The lack of proper waste management also attracted rats and other vermin, which again carried fleas and other diseases. So it was just a big bad circle. The Great Stink of London. This one here was a major environmental crisis. It was a crisis, a stinky crisis that occurred in the summer the hot summer of 1858. The River Thames, which flowed through the heart of the city, well, this was heavily polluted with raw sewage and industrial waste, and the stench was so bad, Parliament had to suspend its sessions. Number six, lot of rats. Yep, watch your feet, it's medieval England, they're gonna bite ya. Imagine you're with your friends and family, you know, gathering around a table, eating bread, drinking ale, gathered around one candle, telling tales, good old medieval times, then all of a sudden you feel a tickle on your leg, what could that be? Be a shame if, I don't know, hundreds of rats began to swarm your feet out of nowhere. Yeah, welcome to the dark ages. This happened. Rats would come out of nowhere and it would suck. Then you have the plague. The plague rolled, or crawled rather, into medieval times back in 1328. And it lasted until 1350. That is a very long time to be stuck with plague rats. It was actually horrible. Don't get me wrong, our plague sucked. That was a lousy few years, no doubt about it. You know, a lot of Ozark, a lot of Netflix, a lot of time off. But I sure as hell didn't see any random swarms of black rats. Did you? Maybe, I don't know, where were you? The European population was reduced by a third and rats were the main cause of spreading. Yeah, way to go guys, you nailed it. Ratatouille and Stuart Little, all you guys planning your little rat attacks, nasty, you're all nasty. No franchises for either of you, no more. These hairy balls of yuck pass it on to everybody. We gotta move on before I throw up. Number five. What? I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really, it's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that and you're just like, oh, what? It, it what got that out of my mouth? That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they use that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? 
I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River, almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung, and people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes, and to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. I, oh God, that's, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake, ooh. Number 10, no lice. You know in elementary school when they would check everyone for lice and one poor sucker had to get their head shaved and walk around as that bald kid for like a month and would probably get bullied? Well that ain't gonna happen back in ancient Egypt because everyone shaved their heads to avoid lice back then and priests would shave their whole bodies just like Michael Phelps. Instead of having actual hair of their own they would wear wigs. Wigs sometimes made of human hair. That honestly was a lot better in that harsh desert sun. Lice and other little pests like that, like fleas, were not wanted. And yeah, they still aren't. But it led to some honestly interesting solutions. For example, a warm potion of date meal and water was believed to drive away fleas and lice. They would use cat's fat to keep away mice, I made a rhyme, and one that probably actually did something was when they used a solution of natron water and salt in their humble abodes to eliminate and repel fleas. Number nine, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day, all night, and feel like I'm about to faint, obviously. Canada gets quite hot. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? What was their trick? They didn't have banana breeze, FPF, SPF 90, whatever the hell it is. Ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty, right? You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Think again, Laura. Their routine was written on tomb walls and scrolls. Rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol was used to block the sun off. Yeah, it was that hard. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. And ancient Greeks as well, they used olive oil as sunscreen as well as ancient Egyptians. Which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You'd be burnt and extremely dehydrated, but also you'd have some nice tan lines and you wouldn't be as pale as me, so it wasn't all bad. Number eight, the finest of cosmetics. The cosmetics of ancient Egypt were not just for looking good, they were for feeling good too. Like on the inside. Now, as such, those professionals who made the stuff took it pretty seriously. Not just because of a passion for the art, but also because they'd be judged pretty damn harshly if they did a bad job. If they sucked, it would mean having the whole neighborhood give you a bad reputation. And in the cosmetics business, just like show business, it's all about that reputation. It would also mean some harsh judgment from the big boys upstairs meaning the gods when you met the afterlife. So yeah, they wanted to do a good job. And to meet that end, they would try and use the finest of ingredients, as they should when people have to put this stuff on their skins and right next to their eyes and stuff. Number seven, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was born, what did people even do to smell good? What, I don't, what happened? Deodorant was actually first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide. It was stored in a metal container, nothing like speed stick at all. It wasn't discreet or anything. It was bad, but ancient Egyptians, 
Eh, even worse. They had to use ostrich eggs when it came to smelling good in the pits. They made perfumes as well and were among the first to use any type of deodorant. So that's that's a pretty good start. Thank you. Thank you so much, ancient Egyptians. Hence the ostrich egg factor. They had to start somewhere. They mixed a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shell, and then nuts, and bam, there you go. You're ready for the day. Just pop it on. Another method was a little more yummy than the ostrich eggs and nuts method. Egyptians would use porridge balls. Yeah, flavored porridge rolled up and securely tucked under your arms. Honestly, that seems like a better alternative. Sometimes when you put antiperspirants or like deodorant on, it gets like all, it all crumbles apart. It's like feta cheese all of a sudden. You're like, what happened to this stick? I want, I would rather have porridge balls than just call it a day, boom. Number six, get this man a Tic Tac or something. Just like I use mints to cure my nasty tea breath, which I argue is worse than coffee breath, the ancient Egyptians used breath mints to keep things fresh. Honestly, they actually sound kinda good. Frankincense, cinnamon, melon, pine seeds and cashews put together, ground up and bound together in candy using honey. <laughs> Just heat that bad boy over the fire and let it cool and boom, breath mints. I like it. I like it a lot. These breath mints would be made commercially by those fine cosmeticians and dentists. Or they could even be made at home. Some archaeological finds of bowls, jars, and other dishes suggest that they may have been candy dishes that would hold the lovely taste in little suckers. Always gotta keep things fun, fresh, and flirty back in ancient Egypt. Breath mints would certainly help you do the trick. <laughs> nice. Number five, moss. We're halfway through and I'll say it again. I'll remind you all again. I have the utmost respect for you ladies. As a guy doing this list and like writing this list, I mean the things you had to craft back then and then, you know, put, uh, oh my lord. For example, going back to the 10th century, this was a time long before Tampax was ever even a thing. Women were forced to get creative when it came to personal hygiene. They had to just figure it out themselves and literally collect grass or moss, sheepskin lined with cotton. It was mostly moss all the time. You all are absolute troopers. If it wasn't moss, other solutions were small pieces of wood with lint wrapped around it. Number four. Q-tips. If you haven't heard, Q-tips are not for your ears. Yeah, I thought this was a rumor. Turns out we're all lawbreakers. I use two at the same time if I'm in a rush. No, flip them. I'm a vigilante when it comes to Q-tips. Q-tips were invented in 1923 by Leo Gertzenzang, right after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Kinda sounds like his wife invented Q-tips, but okay, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-Tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-Tips. That's like a Sweet Baby Rays, that barbecue sauce. Oh, so good. Have they just called it Sweet Rays? Maybe they gave it up to the baby? I don't know. You have to try and work it out. I don't know what the bit is, but I'm like, hey, that's a great sauce, and I just thought of that sauce. Baby Rays, Baby Gays. Back in those days, Q-Tips were dipped in boric acid, and they were intended to sterilize wounds. Yeah, we're just out here like, my eyes roll back every time. I get so, I go way too deep. I get too deeper, I'm like, oh, it's gone. Huh, there it is, magic, I'm a magician. After this, there were even Q soaps, Q oils, Q creams. It's like Apple, like I, iPad, iPhone, the other eye stuff. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be in your ears, what's that about? Well, in 2008, Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax into your ear canal, leading to possible infections more than anything. When Cheesebro Ponds bought the company back in 1962, they added a warning on the box, a warning that we and I gladly still ignore, just talking about this, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go clean my stuff out. Mm. I have Q-tips in my bag, literally, I'm always prepared. Always strapped. Number three, hair removal trick. In the late 19th century, something called thallium actate started to sweep the nation. It was a hair removal method, which even today is the talk of the town. Laser off that peach fuzz for good. Zero, gone. Thallium was used back in the day, but originally thallium was prescribed for those who suffered with ringworm. But even so, thallium didn't do anything per se about the ringworm, it just caused the patient's hair to fall off. So the ringworm was then easier to find. I'd prefer a haircut if you ask me, but sure, thallium does the trick as well. Eventually, thallium was sold as a cream, a toxic cream. It should never touch your skin at all, and it's a face cream. Are you kidding? This thing was once rat poison as well, and now we're rubbing it around like it's Bath and Body Works Noel cream. It's my favorite cream, the green one. Oh God, gone in two days. This was outlawed, thankfully, in the 30s, but it had to get bad pretty first. Number two, Aqua Tofana. Going back to the 1600s for this one. Also, if you're a murderino, you'll enjoy this bit of dark history. Aqua Tofana was a cosmetic that was sold to women in the early 1630s. It was a cosmetic that doubled 
as a poison. Yeah, sneaky, right? Some Assassin's Creed shit going on here. The origins of this deadly cosmetic that was sold and responsible for around like 600 deaths is pretty wild. So back in 1632, two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofana Diamato, they both created this poison. They worked together and created it so that when their husbands kissed them, on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. But eventually, Teofana was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through her daughter, Yulia Teofana. She took this deadly recipe to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and belladonna. Colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. And finally, coming in at number one, more ancient birth control. Okay, we kicked this list off catching up with ancient Egyptians and the uh, aid of acacia trees and all that jazz. So I figured we'd end on a ridiculous birth control method from the ancient Roman days. Seranus, who was known as a Greek gynecologist back then, his idea for Planned Parenthood was not a good one. It was not a good idea. He wrote that after you, you know, bump uglies, in order to prevent pregnancy, the woman must squat and sneeze. First of all, no, not a chance, no, no. And also, if you're thinking about it, no. Secondly, who can sneeze on demand? I certainly can't. I had a really nice time tonight, cheers. <clears throat> that's, not, that's not possible, no. Many methods from the past are questionable. In ancient China, it was commonly told that drinking hot mercury could prevent pregnancy. Yeah, leave mercury away from your body, that will literally kill you. Ancient Greeks would drink blacksmith water because they too thought the exposure to lead could prevent getting pregnant. This idea came back around World War I as well. Women were working in factories and actually trying to get exposed to lead. That was the whole idea. Bad. These are pretty dark, so I'll leave you on this one. In the Dark Ages, European women wore amulets made of weasel testicles to magically ward off pregnancies. Poor weasels. Black magic is the worst, isn't it? Yeah.